Okay, so um, hello everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce Arjun Day. Um, I met Arjun many decades ago. We were together at Berkeley. We were office mates for several years and I can attest that Arjun is a very, very fun person and very fun loving person. Those were, those were great times. So Arjun um, got his um, undergraduate degree from uh, Northwestern University, um, he, a PhD um, from, uh, his master's and PhD from, from Berkeley. And after that, he was a postdoc, um, he was a Hubble Fellow at Johns Hopkins and NOAO. And then he, he has worked in NOAO, NOAO for a long time, uh, since I think 1995 or 96. And he has many awards. Um, in the last three or four years, he got three ORA team awards or ORA, ORA science awards. And this year he got a Guggenheim, Guggenheim, Fellow, Guggenheim Fellowship. And he will be talking to us today about um, lots of data acquired with four meter telescopes. So thank you, Arjun, you can go ahead. Thank you, Rosa. And you know, for someone like Rosa to say that I like to have fun, I mean, that that's like high praise, right? And since you all know Rosa. Um, so I, I, unfortunately, I don't have uh, a lot of science results in the sort of traditional sense to share, but I'll, I'll try and uh, talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing with uh, what used to be, you know, the big telescopes, the four meter telescopes, but are now considered boring and not worth funding anymore. Uh, and, and I'll, whoops. Uh, and, and I'll uh, try and uh, talk about two projects in particular uh, that I've been involved in over the last um, uh, five or six years. Uh, one is the Legacy Surveys Imaging Program, and and the other is DESI, which is which is sort of connected to it. And and we did the Legacy Surveys essentially in order to find targets for DESI. Um, I also wanted to mention that I used to work at NOAO. NOAO is now subsumed into uh, this new entity called uh, the National Science Foundation and it's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory. And I wrote it down so that I, I have to read it every time because the name is so long. Uh, but we go by Noir Lab uh, now. And it includes not only what used to be the old NOAO, but uh, the Gemini International Observatory, the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, a division which used to be part of NOAO, uh, but now is its own entity called CSSTC, which is for, com for uh, community science and uh, data services. Um, and, you know, maybe a new technology center, who knows, things will evolve. But we're new and uh, at least we have a new name with new branding, but we're doing all the same old things. Let me see how I am. Okay. Uh, so before I start, you know, I just wanted to mention that a lot of what we, what I'm going to talk about, uh, is uh, has has been funded and is really due to a huge collaboration, uh, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument Collaboration, uh, otherwise known as DESI, and uh, DESI is made up of uh, 69 participating institutions and has funding both from the National Science Foundation, from the primarily from the U.S. Department of uh, um, Energy's Office of Science, but also many private uh, funding organizations that are listed here and international uh, funding organizations, including CONACYT and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, as you all know, since we all study, study this, uh, we know quite a lot about a very little uh, part of the universe. Right, so we understand uh, what happens with the baryonic component, which constitutes about 4% of the total energy density. Uh, we think we know quite a bit about galaxy evolution and star formation and stellar evolution and so on. And we, we know the fundamentals, at least, and we're trying to fill in the gaps in our understanding in, in, in those uh, pieces. But almost 96% uh, of the rest of the universe's energy density is stuff that we know almost nothing about. We, we know about dark matter, which sort of occupies maybe a quarter of the slide uh, and uh, is in this sort of light gray, represented by this light grayish region. But we don't know what it is. I mean, we know it behaves gravitationally, but we don't know much more about that. Um, and despite you know decades of trying to find dark matter particles, et cetera, uh, we have now sort of 
come to the growing conclusion that that all that money would have been better spent on astronomy, right? Because the best constraints on dark matter uh, have so far come from astrophysical uh, probes. And then there's the stuff that we really don't understand, uh, which is the, the acceleration, the recent acceleration of the universe, recent meaning in the last 8 billion years. Um, and you know, that, that is stuff we, we really have very few ideas about what it even is uh, and have only discovered it in the last you know, 20 odd years. So it's new and a complete mystery to us. We don't even know whether this requires just a modification of our theories of gravity or you know, some, new, some entirely new physics. Um, I think w w this complete you know, growth of ignorance, as I like to call it in the last, uh, or at least growth of our acceptance of our ignorance in the last 25 years, uh, is brings back, brings us home to this idea that astronomy and astrophysics uh, are primarily, you know, very discovery driven fields. We kind of look and see what's out there, we try and measure it and characterize it, you know, we try and build a predictive physical model uh, that can then, you know, say what we might find in our next observations, then we go out and look and we find that that's all wrong and we have to tweak things. And as a result, we stumble across these truths that or you know, that really change our understanding uh, of, of the universe in very fundamental ways. <clears throat> and although we spend a lot of time doing very detailed uh, analyses of certain kinds of objects or processes and so on, it's worth keeping this discovery aspect in mind because I think a lot of astronomy is really driven by, by this by this idea. Um, so I mean this has a long history as you, as you all know, you know Messier put his catalog to the 1770s. Uh, Herschel and uh, you know Carolyn and William Herschel uh, put the first cluster you know catalogs of clusters uh, of stars and and gaseous nebulae and the first galaxies uh, at that point or after Messier of course. Um, and, and so for many, many years, uh, you know, many <laughs> centuries, we have, we've always done this with bigger telescopes. We've gone out and, and tried to survey the sky and catalog it. And it's a, it's a history that doesn't include just astronomy. There are, there are many ways in which uh, these kinds of surveys have really uh, changed the way in which we think about things. One example I, I came across uh, you know, several years ago, which has really fascinated me, is this great trigonometrical survey, which was carried out by the British in India, of course. All, all surveys have some colonial origin, I suppose, and this one certainly did. Uh, it started in, 18, in the 18, early 1800s because the, I suppose the British wanted to map the extent of their empire. So uh, you know, they, they essentially had uh, what they called coolies, which was a polite way of referring to slaves, uh, hold a chain, which was made up of multiple calibrated links uh, between two points and measure, you know, they took this 100 foot chain and measured a baseline. And then they started to essentially use theodolites and uh, measure triangles, divide the whole country into triangles. And in many cases, they went in straight lines, you know, north, south, east, west, uh, and it involved people whose names, some of whose names you might have might have heard. But of course, only the British names, all the <laughs> other people who were involved with it are now nameless, presumably. Uh, and there are lots of great stories about being struck by lightning and encountering tigers and, and so on. But as a result, they had a very precise map of the geography of India. And because they had all these plumb bob theodolite measure and theodolite measurements, they ended up finding that there were differences in gravity or crustal thickness across the, the surface of, of India, which then, you know, they later, uh, later, later scientists realized this had to do with the impact of, of uh, India and sort of the creation of the Himalayas. So that was totally not the original motivation of the survey, but you know that ended up having fundamental effects on uh, how we ended up understanding, uh, you know, a completely different branch of science, right? So it cost a huge amount of money. <laughs> In retrospect, it's it's staggering, but at the same time, it was the discovery. Uh, the, the legacy results of the survey had little to do with why it was done, but it benefited from the fact that it was done in a very systematic way. I mean, another example is is the uh, you know the uh, uh, story of Alexander Humboldt 
going to Peru and climbing Chimborazo. And he was also very methodical in the way in which he did this. As he walked up the mountain, he essentially looked at every single plant that he encountered and made a detailed geographical map of, of where everything was. It's not clear to me why he did this other than the fact that he was just interested in looking to see what was out there. But the result of that was to find that the, uh, the gradations in the types of fauna that you see as you go up this mountain, uh, this volcano, were very similar to the kinds of things he saw in different climactic zones uh, near the Alps or across Europe. And so there was this connection be between how climate affected uh, biology of, of plants in, in, a, in a fundamental way that depended both on altitude and, and not just on latitude. So another interesting you know, outcome of uh, this idea of just looking to see. Well, you know, maybe this is all, a, a, whoops, I dropped out of this. Maybe this is all just a complicated way of saying that even if I don't have any really good reason for doing these surveys, it's worth doing them. Uh, <laughs> they, they do provide a new window on nature. Uh, they give you a sense of the scale of the universe that we live in. And sometimes they really push back those, those horizons, maybe literally even. And in addition to uncovering these global relationships and trends that may point to some fairly fundamental physics, uh, they also raise new questions. And they allow us to sort of understand our place in the universe. And, you know, maybe in the case, since in the colonial examples I was describing before, perhaps breed a false sense of, of ownership. And we have to always be cautious about that, I suppose. So partly motivated by the fact that we wanted to do a large cartographic survey for the purpose of cosmology uh, of the universe, um, we needed to find targets that we, you know, in order to sort of do this sort of three-dimensional survey. And so we started with an imaging survey. We sort of, at the time, this was during my last sabbatical in 2013, 2014, we realized that most of the existing imaging uh, catalogs didn't go deep enough to really probe the Redshift 1 universe adequately. And so in order to do this better, we really needed deeper imaging and we needed to go to a very wide field. And I, I don't want to talk about why, but I, uh, I, we, I can discuss that later if, if we have time. So we planned this, uh, this uh, survey to cover 14,000 square degrees originally of, of the entire sky, both in the North Galactic Cap and the South Galactic Cap. And it was, uh, the main purpose was uh, for cosmology. And so as a result, we mainly uh, surveyed the extra galactic sky, so the high galactic latitude sky. So unfortunately, it ignored uh, much of the sky that uh, is probably of most interest to many of the people on, on, on this call. Um, the idea was to go deep, so much deeper than the Sloan Imaging Survey. Um, and we, we planned this in different pieces because of the amount of work and uh, telescope time it involved. It really was three different surveys that we cobbled together. So one was called DECALS, the Dark Energy Camera Legacy Survey. Uh, one was called the Mosaic uh, Legacy Survey, Z-Band uh, Legacy Survey. And there was another one which was done at the Bach Telescope, um, which was called BASS. And these three, and that was really led by uh, our Chinese uh, collaborators and uh, our U of A collaborators. So those three surveys together covered this 14,000 square degrees. And in addition, you know, the dark energy survey, which, was, which had built the dark energy camera at CTIO, uh, had also already imaged a significant part of the sky, but most of it lay south of what we could reach with Kitt Peak. Um, and so we used their data wherever we could. And since then, you know, everybody is using dark energy cameras at uh, Cerro Tololo. And so we essentially took all the public data from the uh, NOAO, now Noir Lab archive, uh, that were in these three bands and included them in our, in our total survey. So the survey now covers about 20,000 square degrees of sky fairly uniformly uh, to these depths that are listed here of G of about 25, R24, Z23. And they're really great for doing large cosmological surveys because of the uniformity in which we, we created them. And from the inception, because we're funded primarily by taxpayer dollars, you know, we wanted all of this to be completely public. So from day zero, when we started collecting data, all our imaging data were public. We had 
multiple multiple data releases where we just release the catalogs publicly. So none of us have had any time really to do any of the science <laughs> with, with the survey, but there have been lots of papers coming out using the science from the survey, which is, I guess, a testament to its uh, success. Um, so the basic footprint was this. Uh, uh, the galax sorry, the slide looks terrible on my screen. I hope it's not much, <laughs> it's not worse on yours. Uh, but but this is the galactic plane, of course. And here's the North Galactic Cap part of the survey, the South Galactic Cap part of the survey. This sort of strange-looking darker part here is the dark energy is the region covered by the dark energy survey, which we uh, appropriated into into our data. And this was the region covered by decals, the, everything south of uh, 30 degrees uh, declination. And this is a Z-band map, uh, and there are lots of these kinds of maps all available uh, on, on the LegacySurvey.org website. Uh, you know, none of this can happen without a huge number of people. I've listed names here in two columns on the left of the people who are who are very closely involved with the uh, uh, management, data reduction, uh, code writing, et cetera, planning of, of, and, and work that was done. But that those don't represent the, you know, the people who actually made it possible, right? Because we don't run telescopes and so on without huge numbers of people. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, my phone is uh, making all kinds of strange noises. Let me see if I can turn this off. Um, <clears throat> without a lot of people contributing both to keep the observatories functioning, uh, you know, to feed you when you go to the telescope, to keep everything clean, the, the, the families who put up with your nonsense while you're spending all of your time doing this. Uh, it was a gigantic amount of support. It took you know, over a thousand nights of telescope time represented here starting in about, uh, you know, 2014, at least for our part, you know, including the DES is even more. Uh, there were 126 observers involved in just these two surveys that I was primarily leading, uh, and then many, you know, along with David Schlegel, and, and many, many more for the other surveys that we appropriated, or time allocation committees, etc. I, I, I'm sorry I'm spending so much time on this slide, but I think often we do projects and we, um, you know, write papers as astronomers, and you know, there are a few authors on the paper list, but it masks this support structure without which none of this would be possible. And I mean, it's really a growing realization for me uh, over the years as to what it really takes to pull one of these things off. And this doesn't even include the people from whom we borrow land from in order to actually perform these kinds of explorations. So for the legacy surveys, we adopted a, a, a different strategy for making catalogs. I mean, we, we really thought this was a, an opportunity to, to break out in a new direction. You know, normally, we take many images to get to a deep uh, image of the sky, and we add them all together. And from the ground, of course, we're limited because the seeing varies, the weather varies, the clouds, et cetera, all kinds of things. You know, water vapor increases and changes your band pass. So how, how do you deal with, with all of this in a, in a, in a systematic way? and in a way that preserves the quality of the data that you're dealing with. And so we implemented, well, Dustin Lang implemented what was essentially his, an idea that he and David Hogg had come up with, which, we, which is known as the tractor, and it was to forward model the entire sky. So what that means is you take an image of the sky and you model every single source in some simple algorithmic way, uh, but you fit to all of the individual data frames. Every individual CCD frame is treated separately uh, and not uh, as a single stack, and then you just add up the flux, right? So you, you basically optimize the, the measurements of the flux and the shape using the everything from your best seeing data to your worst seeing data uh, and under all conditions. So we do this by first creating an initial detection image where we just stack everything in a you know, weighted way. Then we just detect only to form, to understand where the sources are. And then after that, we fit to all the individual frames. And we do this with a, with a simple uh, set of sources, you know, a point source, uh, a point source, which is just usually stars and quasars, something that has a devocular profile, something that has an exponential profile, something that has any profile in between as represented by a Sursich uh, uh, formula. Uh, something, when you get to very faint objects and you can't determine any shape, we just wanted something that was a round exponential that was 
you know, easy to, to model and had few parameters. And then this dupe thing is something that had to do with the fact that we knew where all the Gaia stars were. Uh, and if Gaia catalog also has some galaxies and so if things were confused or uh, a bright galaxy, we, we had that separate class to deal with them. Um, we use the same model in all bands. So this does not work well for galaxies where the morphology is changing dramatically across the bands. But since we were we cared about the faint universe, this wasn't a big deal, you know, with our ground-based images. And then we did force photometry on all the wise data. So it the, the catalogs that we made public come along with the wise 3.6, 4.5, etc. Um, band passes I mean, uh, photometry. And here, here's the, the result. So on the left, well, <laughs> I should let you guess which one is the image and which one is the model. But uh, if you look closely, you'll be able to tell the difference. Uh, the picture on the left is the, or on my left, which I guess is your left also, uh, it is the image of the sky. And the picture on the right is the model that was created to match that. And if you go to this website here, uh, uh, you'll be, I don't know if I can do this, can I do this? I can do this on my screen, but I guess I can, uh, oh well, I, I won't do this right now. I'll, I'll come back to this later if you don't mind. Uh, if, you, if you go to this website up here on top, this legacysurvey.org website, um, you can browse these images for this entire 20,000 square degree region and they're just spectacular. And there are also other catalogs and, and sky surveys that are included there and you can play with it. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, so that, that's, that was a viewer that was built uh, to explore the data. Um, I've already discussed this, so I, I won't uh, talk about this uh, too much. We can come back to this if anybody has questions. So the catalogs that we produced include uh, GRZ, WISE, uh, shape measurements, multi-epoch photometry. So if you're looking for sources that are variable, this is you know, the, all the data are available here, um, and a red, matched redshift catalog. Uh, and then for our most latest data release, we uh, created, I should say, John Moustakis primarily uh, created what we call the Siena Galaxy Atlas, which is named after John's uh, university, uh, Siena College. And it basically created a spe you know, a special stacks for all the large galaxies, meaning things that were larger than a certain radius. Uh, so we did special stacks of those, created custom mosaics, and then measured photometry and surface brightness profiles uh, and aperture photometry for all of these galaxies. And that's also public and, and uh, very useful for low redshift galaxy studies, nearby galaxy studies. So like I said, you know, we haven't had much time to do science with it, but lots of other people have. And I just wanted to highlight one or two uh, projects that um, I've been involved with very peripherally uh, or uh, been, you know, have witnessed appear. So here's one. Uh, this was a study by Anna Bonassa uh, of the tidal tails uh, from PAL-5. And these are again, uh, the, the picture on the left is a density map of stars on the sky in the region of the PAL-5 clusters. And you can see the scale. This is a 20, 30 degree long structure. The cluster is in the very center of the, re the, uh, of the system here. And then you can see these beautiful narrow tidal tails, which as you look more closely actually have little spurs and features and so on, which are described in the paper. Uh, so just a, a beautiful study of how, you know, one can not only identify these streams cleanly, but if, then if you later go get velocities for all the stars, you also have a, a, a unique probe on the small scale structure of the dark matter distribution because these are long lived dynamical features uh, when they interact with you know small sub halos that fly flying that might be flying around uh, in our galaxy uh, in our galaxy's halo you'd see perturbations on these on these streams <clears throat> um, of course again in the look see kind of uh, mode one can look at look for gravitational lenses in the data. So this was a study that was led by Xiaosheng Huang at, at San Francisco State University. And he and his students developed this uh, neural network to try and identify gravitational lenses from the imaging data. And there's a paper that just came out this <clears throat> a few months ago, which has a, more than a thousand, about 1200 new gravitational lenses just from about half of the data set. Um, and it's just a, this is just a, uh, 
a picture gallery of, of many of them. Um, and you can see, you know, small arcs, large arcs. Um, there, are, in some cases, things that are Einstein cross-like objects, etc. Um, so quite a data mine for for um, longer term studies where we try and monitor the brightness of these things to say control to, uh, to constrain the Hubble constant as a function of redshift, for example. <clears throat> Of course, one of the, the great powers of this uh, survey is that you can also find things that are not detected in it. So, so for example, this is this was a study by Xiao uh, Hui Fan and his students, uh, led by his student Pei Shi Wang, who's now a postdoc, uh, looking for high rich of quasars. And they used our survey not because not to detect objects, but to make sure that objects were not detected in it. So these were things that were detected by J and K and so on in the uh, in the UKIDS uh, survey, UKIDS survey, and this was a, a quasar redshift of about seven and a half. And um, so anyway, I, I thought it was a cute cute use of our of our data. And then uh, Dennis Zaritsky and, and his team have been using uh, the survey to look for ultra diffuse galaxies. Uh, they started by doing this in the coma cluster, primarily motivated by the, the studies of uh, Peter van Dockum's group, um, finding these very diffuse and sometimes extremely large galaxies that don't seem to have very well developed bulges for some reason. Um, and you know, they found many, they've been getting spectroscopy of some, and now they're expanding their search uh, to the entire survey footprint. Uh, so we should know about both field versions of these galaxies and the, the cluster versions and the differences between them. And just as a quick curiosity, you know, the field versions of these galaxies tend to have more star formation in them than the ones that are inside clusters and the exact reasons are not really understood. Or even what's fueling uh, the star formation in these very wimpy systems that lie in the middle of nowhere. Okay, so please, you know, use the survey, put your students onto it. Uh, as you can see, it detects not only distant galaxies, but all the, the stuff in the Milky Way that's between us and them. Uh, the picture in the background here shows all the filaments from uh, of interstellar cirrus, I, I assume. Uh, this is because they're green in this because the green color is from the R band, and I suspect this is just H alpha emission coming from these from these regions. Uh, so it, it's quite a, a data mine for, for all kinds of science. And I particularly invite you, even if you're doing not, uh, if you're not interested in the actual data, uh, when you're sitting down with a glass of wine to, uh, to look at the viewer, because it's really fun to just explore the sky in this way. So the reason we did that survey, of course, was because we wanted to uh, create a data set uh, that could be used to, to explore or to constrain cosmology and to understand this sort of weird acceleration of the universe that we're currently seeing. And I have to say that, you know, although we do funding agencies and so on, we talk in great detail about how we will constrain cosmological parameters and so on and so forth. Since we have absolutely no idea what, what dark energy is, uh, I, I think this is really a shot in the dark. You know, it's really the idea that, that if we try and measure the parameters of the theory that we currently understand, at least predicts it, even if we don't understand the theory, we predicts uh, the, this acceleration uh, with, a, with a parameter. Um, we can, by, by trying to make these precise measurements, maybe we'll gain some new insight into what this is about. There's no guarantee that we will do that. We set these metrics saying we'll get down to some level of measuring a parameter, but you know, it's really a look-see kind of project. <clears throat> So what we did was we took the four meter telescope at Kitt Peak, the Mayall telescope, which is, has, has a long uh, history of doing surveys of the sky. It was in fact built uh, because we, it wanted, it was going to be a wide field telescope, which by that, that, that time meant like a 16 arc minute field of view. Um, and it, it was built sort of as a counterpoint to the Palomar uh, telescopes, which were going to be narrow field of view, you know, large pieces of glass. This was a somewhat smaller but wider field of view, so you could explore the universe. We, we ripped off the top end of the telescope and we put a new top end on it. And the reason we had to do that was because we had to hold a very heavy uh, new uh, focal plane uh, enclosure. And the focal plane enclosure contained a new corrector, which was six elements, uh, you know, that provided a three-degree diameter field of view. 
uh, it held its focal plane of 5,000 fibers and all the uh, fiber cables and electronics and all of that to control it. The fiber cables are 60 meters that run all the way around the telescope in various ways to prevent themselves from kinking and come down into the old Coudet room of the telescope, which then contains these 10 three-arm spectrographs uh, that cover the wavelength range from 3,800 angstroms to 9,800 angstroms at a resolution going sort of smoothly from about 2,200 in the blue to about 5,000 in the red. So it, it, it's really a very complex system with all of these parts. This uh, focal plane also is held by hexapods and is a, it, so that we can really focus and tilt, tilt and tip and guide, et cetera. Um, there's also a fiber view camera, which is mounted in the Cassegrain cage, looking up through the telescope and through the corrector at the focal plane so that we can back illuminate the fibers and make sure they're pointing correctly, et cetera. And the goal of all of this was so that we could you know, do a survey that of something like 30 to 40 million galaxies and quasars uh, and do it at a rate that was about 50,000 spectra every night. Now, that, that, that was the goal. Um, and the scientific goal was by doing that, we would get to these sort of sub percent constraints on the cosmological uh, parameters. So I already said this, it's a very complex system. And I thought I would just show you some pictures to sort of give you an idea of the scale of this, because it was just fascinating to watch this all come together, uh, involving so many countries and so many different places and such a great uh, number of uh, fabulous engineers and so on. So here's the new top ring coming into the bay, garage bay doors at the four meter. There's a person for scale. This was the outer enclosure of the focal plane enclosure. <clears throat> uh, we first had to remove the old top end out of the four meter and bring it down and store it. It's actually just sitting outside in the rain <laughs> uh, on the mountaintop and, and mount this new top end onto, onto the, it. So we first put it inside the dome and then from the dome, we, uh, we on the dome floor, we uh, you know, assembled both it and the, the corrector barrel and then put them both on the telescope. The lenses uh, were, were made by Viavi, uh, and you can see this, the, the largest one was a little over a meter in size, but one of the, almost 1.2 meters <clears throat> in size. Uh, but it's a six element corrector, which includes uh, two elements that rotate because it's the ADC, it's the atmospheric dispersion, dispersion compensator. So it's two prisms that actually have power on them and rotate. Uh, and that's shown here on, on the right. Here's the corrector barrel. Uh, so the corrector is inside here, uh, and the, the focal plane is behind it. And then here is the these are the hexapod arms that allow it to tip and tilt and so on. And on the right, uh, it's a little hard to see because I have such different scales here. You know, here's Patrick uh, Donald, but 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 here uh, is is a hand uh, holding one of the single fiber positioners. Uh, so these are robotic positioners. <clears throat> they are made. They have these little Swiss motors that are very tiny uh, that allow you to control it in two dimensions. So there's a theta arm and a phi arm. So it's like two. Uh, uh, it, it's like a cantilevered well, elbow, I guess. So you can rotate in this way and you can move your elbow around. So, but it does that in with a larger range of motion than my elbow permits. Um, and I think. I'm going to try and play this movie. This sort of shows you a little bit about what it is. So the, each of these fiber positioners, uh, we had sets of 500 of them that were put into one of these uh, pizza wedges uh, that held the fiber positioners. And there are 10 of these wedges to fill the full focal plane. Um, and that's this is one with them partially filled. Oops, I was trying to move forward, but it's replaying the movie. Oops, how do I? Interesting. OK, here we go. Um, this is a, a zoom in. Uh, and again, these are only moving in one dimension. So they're not, you don't see the other motion. So they move both in this uh, uh, circle, but also you see where this little purple thing is. That's the fiber tip. And those also rotate separately 
so that you can move it to almost any position in, in the focal plane. So these fiber positioners each cover about one arc minute of, of their, their patrol radius is about an arc minute, and they can overlap with the patrol radius of a nearby fiber positioner. So we really have access to the full sky. And it's very complicated because you don't want these to bump into each other and so on. And so a lot of the time over the last several months has gone into making sure that this we have software that prevents these collisions that you know makes the positioners work safely etc plus you know we're dumping a huge amount of heat every time we move these positioners right into the focal plane we have to be able to extract that safely not move them so much that we you know either damage them or create too much heat so it's, it's a very fine balance between all of this um, so here's the full focal plane on your right uh, the fibers run from there down a complicated path in the telescope and come into this room, uh, which is thermally controlled to sub-degree temper uh, uh, temperature variations, actually it's about a tenth of a degree temperature variations. Uh, and you can see that the spectrographs mounted in these two racks. So there are five on top and five at the bottom. And actually, there, right now, there were only four on, on top and four on the bottom, and there's a new one coming into each of these. The spectrographs have three arms, so they cover this wavelength range from 3,800 to 9,800, 3,600 to 9,800, almost uh, with a f almost flat response. It falls off a little bit below 4,000 angstroms. Uh, and so they have, you know, uh, three arms here, one uh, that goes from 3,600 to about 5,800, that next one goes to about 7,400 and then uh, out to 9,800, and uh, three sets of CCDs, three sets of cryostats, so there's a lot of things that can fail. But it doesn't, and it all sort of works. It's kind of amazing to me still that it all sort of works. Uh, the science goals, the science mission was to measure the cosmic distance scale parameters uh, to sub percent levels. So the aggregate precision over the full redshift range that DESI will cover are all at the few tenths of a percent uh, and about 1% at the, in, the, in the higher uh, range. So in these two ranges, we're just the, the zero to about 1.7 or so. We basically just use uh, galaxies and quasars to measure uh, the BAO uh, feature and determine um, this uh, the cosmic scale parameters. So the Hubble constant as a function of redshift and the angular diameter distance as a function of redshift. At the highest redshift bin, we use quasar absorption lines. So we really only have a, a transfer, you know, a line of sight uh, measure of, of the BAO scale. But we do this in a densely packed region so we can sort of try and reconstruct the, the, uh, the horizontal regions through this far sampling. Um, in addition, so those are our main science goals, really, to just use the BAO and measure the distance scale. But the sort of additional goals were to measure the growth of structure, because that also gives you uh, a constraint both on inflation and on uh, and on gravity. Um, <clears throat> so we measure this F sigma eight parameter to a few percent across the range over which we're covering galaxies, um, and that feeds into a measure of the running index of the uh, the running spectral index of of the uh, core of the power spectrum and we are hoping to measure that to about 0.4 percent accuracy so because we're also measuring structure and the clustering of galaxies that tells it gives us a constraint on the the other uh, particles in the universe that might contribute to the mass or take uh, carry mass away from dense regions. And so as a result, we can also constrain the sum of all the neutrino families, the, the total uh, mass of, of all of them uh, to about uh, 0.02 eV. And then, of course, I won't talk about it, but since it's, you know, the, the, re the real gains might really be in astrophysics, but I'll, I'll come to that maybe at the end. So those science mission goals fed down into uh, trying to do a 14,000 square degree survey. Our minimum survey is going to be 9,000 square degrees. So we'll see how how well we'll, we're really able to finish 14,000 in a five year span. Um, and there were four sets of targets that we chose for these. So there are things that are in modern lingo are called luminous red galaxies, but they're really just ellipticals and their and their pre predecessors. Uh, over a wide range of redshift. Uh, emission line galaxies, which is anything that has an O2 emission line. So this is a 3727 doublet of, of oxygen. Uh, quasars, by, and here the name really means any AGN, uh, and bright galaxies, which really meant any galaxy that was brighter than about 19.2 
uh, or so in the R band. <clears throat> uh, and the, these are all, I, I, there's a little strip that I'm showing here, which identifies many of these sources on the legacy sky survey images. So this BGS is the bright galaxy survey. Uh, these yellow things are all stellar objects. Uh, QSOs are in green. Uh, red are LRGs, and these little blue circles that are everywhere are the emission line galaxies. So the goal is to get redshifts for everything down to about 150 kilometers per second or better, which is easy for galaxies for the most part, hard for quasars. <clears throat> and in addition, get spectra of about 8 million stars in the Milky Way, uh, hopefully to map out the, the kinematics of the halo, because for all of these stars, uh, we have Gaia proper motion, so this adds the third dimension in radio velocity, and so we would really get a really great picture of the, the kinematics and dynamics of the halo, uh, since it retains its you know, the fossil history of the entire formation of the halo uh, over the galaxy's lifetime, because the dynamical times are so long. So this slide just summarizes what I just said. We're getting about 30 million redshifts. 2.4 million quasars, 17 million emission line galaxies, 4 million luminous red galaxies, and 10 million bright galaxies. And all of the Sloan survey basically fits in this, in this circle here that's in white with black dots. Um, and here are the constraints that we're hoping to get. So these are predictions based on uh, the errors we, we suspect will be typical of our survey observations. Uh, so you, you get down to sort of very in, in this plane of uh, W0 and W prime, so the first derivative of the equation of state of dark matter, um, and this is essentially lambda, right? Um, we get down to very small levels with just DESI. So it's not including any other, you know, uh, 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 surveys that might contribute to it. It does include Planck, Planck priors. And on the right, these are the constraints that you get on the growth factor. Um, for I like to think of this really as an experiment that's measuring the expansion history of the universe to sub percent accuracy. And so, although I gave you those very small percentage uh, uncertainties in the beginning, you know, this is really the breakdown as a function of redshift. And it's really remarkable that we'll be able to do this across such a huge uh, span of cosmic time. And then, you know, here's the, the figure that everyone has to show, which shows uh, the constraints that come from our survey, which are in this sort of grayed out region here in red on the bright galaxy side and black uh, on, on, on the uh, dark uh, survey side that show you the, 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 le the levels of precision we'll get to compared to lots of other surveys, most of which have not yet launched. So in addition to the, the main survey, you know, we, the idea is that there'll also be fibers available because we won't be able to target everything we want to target. And so we have two kinds of secondary target programs for DESI. One is a set of dedicated tiles. And so the idea there is essentially you point to specific regions, you occupy all the fibers, you try and do either very dense surveys in, in regions uh, or very deep surveys. And, we, and I've listed some of the ones that we've been working on here. Um, <clears throat> the M31 is really something for the future, but we're just doing a few tests uh, currently to see what's actually feasible. Um, and then spare fibers, you know, people proposed a whole bunch of different projects and we're trying to work through, we'll try and work through them as we get into the main survey. So we had first light with DESI last, uh, in October 2019, and I wish I was telling you the results from the first year of our observations, but we were shut down in March for because of uh, COVID, as, as you know. But we did commission much of the instrument uh, in the beginning. So this gives you an idea of the field of view. Uh, it's about three degrees in diameter. Here's M33, uh, the great galaxy in triangulum. Um, and th this red dot is actually in the wrong space. This spectrum is really from close to the nucleus, uh, but it shows you the both the wavelength coverage uh, and you know the the richness of the of the spectrum. I mean the resolution is in fact good enough that we split the O2 doublet even for essentially a zero redshift uh, galaxy. Well, it's actually not redshifted; it's blue shifted. 
Um, this was another one of the early observations we took when we just had one functioning wedge in that focal plane. So just one of those pie, pizza pie regions. And this is the California Nebula. It's a beautiful picture taken by an amateur in Greece. But you can see this is the H alpha and N2 lines. And I'm, I just plotted them on every fiber, location of every fiber. And you can see, again, how this varies. Right. And then here's the O2 line, which uh, again at zero redshift, you can see the doublet splitting quite nicely, which shows you how, how well the spectrographs uh, are, are, are performing. Uh, this was a picture we took of M31 in February. So uh, the, the little orange dots uh, that are overlaid on, on the uh, uh, picture of, of M31 in the background, which comes from the WISE data, um, show you where all the fibers were. <clears throat> and this is a view that we get uh, while we're observing that analyzes the spectrum and tells us what the signals to noise is in each of the fibers. And you can clearly see the entire galaxy, basically, in, in just it's, it's like a very poor image, right, in this raw signal to noise ratio uh, from, from the focal plane. It's just spectacular. Uh, so Sergei Koposov took the data from, from that observation that I was showing you and put together um, the the rotation curve essentially of the galaxy. So the the, the blue dots are all coming towards us uh, in you know relative to the rest frame of the motion of the galaxy, and the orange and red dots are going away from us. And you can see this this sort of sense of the motion uh, quite clearly. Um, here's M thirty three again. So this is uh, from those early observations that we did. Uh, the plot on the left is is just the y, the wise image again of M M thirty three, and the picture on the right here uh, is showing you the rotation curve again, uh, spatially resolved using just the H alpha line. And I have to say that you know these data are really not science quality, because this was a reduction I just did from the raw spectra by fitting each of the H alpha lines and just measuring the velocity. Uh, and uh, you know you can see it overlaid on the galaxy. Uh, just to show you, I guess, if we didn't know that the galaxy was rotating before, which we did, uh, we now do. So we've started getting survey uh, observations in what we call the 1% survey, which is trying to cover 140 square degrees of the sky uh, and uh, measuring, you know, just to test out whether we're selecting the samples correctly, whether our redshift precision is what we want, whether our redshift completeness is what we want, whether our fibers are all finding their targets. Uh, this is a picture of the coma cluster. And here are the redshifts we've collected on the coma cluster, right? And I, I'm showing you this because I, I, I just want to show you that so many objects in this field now have redshifts. So it's, <laughs> this is the this is the targeted uh, these are the targeted objects that we have spectra for uh, on this field already. It's just mind-boggling. So two nights ago. Uh, we completed our one millionth spectrum, which is a, that is one millionth unique extragalactic redshift. So we also have 450,000 stars or something like that uh, as of as of two nights ago. Uh, here's the redshift histogram, and the reason it looks has this funny shape is because it includes these low redshift samples, which are the, LR, the mainly the bright galaxy sample and low redshift uh, luminous red galaxies. And then it includes this ELG sample, which is sort of around redshift to one. LRGs and ELGs have this bump that covers this. And then this long tail is mainly the quasars, essentially, that go out to high redshift, where we are trying to do as many quasars as possible, then subselect to just the ones that are at high enough redshift so we can do Lyman alpha forest observations. And then those will get deeper observations over the five years. Uh, so I don't know how much of these data I'm actually supposed to be showing anyone because this is all sort of science quality, but these are all plots that I just make to, to, to have fun. It's just like you know, playing in a sandbox. But I thought it really conveys the quality of the redshifts. So here's a stack that I just made uh, and I'll these are just from data from about a week in April, and they're only objects at redshifts between 1.0 and 1.005, so a very narrow slice. And there were about 1,300 of them, and I just added them together without caring what they were, and this is a weighted average. Uh, but you can see that all the narrow lines of you know things like iron and magnesium and even the carbon-3 uh, semi-forbidden emission line, th these are all fairly narrow features, but they are easily visible simply because you know, the, the redshift quality that comes out of the automatic pipeline is, is quite is so good. 
Um, we basically finish observing in the morning, and by 11 o'clock or so, all the redshifts are computed uh, fr from the previous night's observations. So DESI's survey valid, what we've called the survey validation phase, just to make sure that everything's working, uh, is almost over. Uh, we have over a million galaxy redshifts at this point, uh, galaxy and quasar redshifts, and about uh, a four tenths of a million stars. Uh, the main survey is probably going to start, uh, you know, not in on Monday, but the the following Monday. So we think we're almost ready to proceed to that. And at that point, we run for five years doing nothing but but the survey. We are still planning some upgrades to the system. It's working very well. Our inter-exposure time is about 130 seconds to position these 5,000 fibers and you know start the next observation uh, through the telescope, et cetera. Um, but we want to bring that number down. So we really want to be less than two minutes if we if we can. Uh, we have identified various problems with the electronics of how the petals are controlled and and how the fibers are controlled. We want to. Uh, see if we can remedy that. Um, so hopefully we'll be, we're trying to plan that effort for the summer shutdown. Um, but <laughs> I mean, just the fact that we have almost a million redshifts, more than a million redshifts in hand before we've even started the survey just tells you the potential of this instrument to sort of revolutionize so many different studies in astronomy. I mean, the data will become public. I don't know what the time scale will be. Uh, but we're hoping that every year we'll have a release to the collaboration and then, you know, sort of six months after that or so, there'll be a release, uh, there'll be a public release of the data. Uh, there's some sensitivity associated with the, with the uh, cosmology studies, but as far as the astrophysics studies are concerned, I think people just want to make these things available uh, so that everyone can use the data. Of course, it also means that in five years, we'll have to be doing something different. Uh, our main survey will end in 2026. Um, and at that point, DESI will still be the best uh, spectroscopic machine on the planet. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what should we do next? We don't have funds for this, but I think we've started thinking about how, uh, what kinds of science projects we would do. And I've listed some of them here um, since I've, been talking for too long now. I should probably stop. But uh, you know, some of the ideas are to basically just do a Milky Way survey. You could, you could get almost you know thirty or forty million stars in 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 five years if you if you wanted to do that. And I think that's where most of the next generation of science is going to be. It's really going to be in understanding the small scale structure in our halo and trying to pull that apart. Okay, so I'll leave my summary up. I think I've said all of these things already and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. So thank you and thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk to you. It's so nice to see so many old friends. Thank you very much, Arjun. That's an excellent talk. Looking forward to the data. Do we have any questions? Let me see. Oh, I see a couple of hands up. Let me check. Um, right, we have uh, Heinz first. From the Guanajuato University, and I'm curious to know whether it's still possible to <clears throat> to make proposals for the free fibers if they are still are over the five years, and what would be the procedure to to submit those proposals? Uh, uh, you know, your question is is, is uh, raising post traumatic stress syndrome for me. <laughs> And, and I, the reason I say that is because when we originally devised DESI, at least from the NOAO and NORLAB side, we wanted to, it to be like the dark energy survey. So we wanted the, the instrument to be primarily running the survey, but to have time for PI driven projects that were separate from this, either through spare fibers or through uh, you know, other modes. But that is completely restricted at the moment to within the collaboration because the National Science Foundation at the time was down a path of wanting to show that it was giving up sites if it was going to invest in new ones. And so there is no public access, unfortunately, to this instrument, which is which is very depressing to me personally. However, um, I, you know, th th there are ways of entering the collaboration. Uh, and you know, the easiest one is with hard cash, which is, of course, impossible for everybody. Uh, but there are external collaboration uh, uh, 
uh, routes into the into the project. So if you know someone who's at an institution that has access to DESI, that is probably the best route. In terms of the specific issue of the extra fibers, the way we are operating this is that uh, we had a call for proposals within the collaboration for what to do with extra fibers. Those projects will, that were selected will run for the first year. There'll be a second call for the next year uh, sometime, I'm guessing, towards the end of this calendar year or early in the spring of next year, and then we'll select the projects that will run for the next year and so on. So the idea is to have yearly calls for using extra fibers or dedicated projects, but at the moment they're all uh, confined to within the, the uh, survey collaboration. Including for the second year, right? Yes, that's right now that's that's still the plan that it'll only be internal. However, uh, there are people at UNAM who are actual members of uh, the DESI collaboration. So, you know, I, I would say the best path is to try and go through them and, and show them that there's more interesting science to be done than just cosmology. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Heinz. Uh, it's here. Hi, Arjun. Nice Hi, it's here. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again and to see you well. Um, I um, I was curious about that uh, synthetic image that uh, you show us with tractor, and I just wanted to know whether, um, in your opinion, there is any advantage of just running through this process. Is there any new results that one can get from uh, going to the frame by frame fitting, or uh, you will advise everybody to just go to the traditional solution of just yeah, yeah I, I'm sold. I was, I was a skeptic, and at least for the science that I do, um, it's very hard for me to think to do anything better than this. So uh, for faint galaxies where the, the light is well modeled, in fact, let me see if I can, uh, sorry, I want to stop sharing here for a minute, uh, get out of my full screen mode, let me see if I can just very quickly uh, bring up something, I don't know if I can... So let me see if I can just share this. Hopefully this will work. Uh, so this is the LegacySurvey.org website, right? So here, here is some random spot in the sky. Um, every time you reload the page, it goes to some other beautiful galaxy. So, uh, but <clears throat> it shows you the RA and deck, and you can upload catalogs and, and look for things. And this should show you very clearly the, the pluses and minuses of this. So on the right bar here, these are the images. You know, here, here are the models. And you can see immediately the, the good things and the bad things, right? The good things are everything that's faint and small and well-defined is perfectly well-modeled. Things like this are totally messed up. Bright stars are messed up, but that's okay. We fix them with Gaia and we fit a point spread function and so on. So we tend to fit them slightly differently within a certain radius. And if you look at the residual map, you'll, you'll see this issue, right? So the big galaxy is a mess. Uh, everything else is fabulous, right? It's totally, it's gone away completely. And so if I increase the brightness or the contrast, you really can't see, you can see the cores of stars, but beyond that, you've done incredibly well in terms of the model. The good thing about it is because you're using all the individual frames and you're not smoothing anything to match all the PSFs, you're preserving the noise qualities and you're not degrading the data. So the shape constraints are biased towards the best seeing images. The flux constraints come from wherever you have the best signal to noise. You know, so the, the least, the horrible data are just weighted down, but they contribute where they can for diffuse objects or whatever. So it really does produce the optimal map of the sky, but only for these objects that are well measured. So that's why for these bigger galaxies, we separated them out into the, the Siena Galaxy Atlas and fit their surface brightness profile separately because we want to do that. It's computer intensive, but I really think source extractor, you know, should be just thrown away and we should all move to move to this. That's that's my personal opinion. So you know of course it requires having access to a supercomputer and running the code, but the code's all public and supercomputers are just getting faster. So I think it's just going to be easier and easier to start doing this. Thank you. Thanks, Itziar. Rosa? 
Thank you, Arjun. It's very, very exciting. So um, summarizing, what's the resolution? What's the depth? And in the uh, releases, will we have access to the images, to the raw images? Uh, are you talking about the imaging survey or the spectroscopic survey? There's the imaging survey. Ah, <laughs> imaging survey, you have access already to everything. So you have the raw images, the stack that we created these stacks. So, you know, in that uh, picture I was showing you, um, sorry, let me just go back here because it's easier to show. So if I go back to the actual data, you know, the, the, the sky is, um, let me do this so you can actually see something. The, the whole sky is already available. It's all public. So there's the actual pixels that go into all of this uh, exist. Right, so sorry, I, it's a uh, survey is a little too big. Um, okay, so this is the North Galactic Cap. Here's the South Galactic Cap. Um, all of that exists. If, if you zoom into any part of the sky, um, and I put up, you know, th these uh, what we define, we break up the sky into these bricks. So there are stacked images in each of these bricks that are available, along with the models and the uh, uh, residual images, in each of the individual bands. Um, the actual data and the catalogs are also available. So if you never want to look at the and from NOAO through Data Lab, um, if you wanted to look for just a single object, you know you can get cutouts, both the JPEG and FITS, whatever you want. Uh, you can look at all the single exposure images uh, if, if you want the images, the models, the you know etc. The data quality maps. Um, so. I think uh, you, you just need the disk space if you want to download it all, or you can interact with, through Data Lab and just use the data as they are at the Noir Lab site. And, and what is the resolution? Uh, it's about uh, the median seeing was about an arc second uh, across all of the data. The, it, it's a little different in the north and the south. Uh, the, in the north, we had mainly um, um, the Z band, the seeing is very good. It's actually slightly, it's, it's about one arc second exactly, the median. But the G and R are worse. They're about, because they were taken with the Bach 90 prime uh, instrument, and Bach has much worse seeing. So that's about 1.3, I would say, uh, in terms of its uh, image quality. Yeah. And the spectra, then, when will it be? Uh, the spectra, the resolution of the spectra go from uh, 2,000 in the blue end to about 5,000 in the red end. So they, uh, you know, you basically look through the OH forest uh, and you can split the O2 doublet across the entire redshift range from zero to uh, 1.6, where you hit the end of our wavelength coverage for O2 anyway. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rosa. Do we have any other questions? I had a question. I was curious about, uh, your data rate and your data volume. So compared to, for example, the Rubin Observatory, which claims that they're gonna have 30 terabytes a night at 100 gigab gigabits a second. So do you have an estimate of what your survey is gonna- Oh gosh, I'm sure there are and there are probably, but I, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Our data rate is tiny. And the okay. reason is because we're just getting spectra, right? So we only have, even the raw data are only 30 CCDs uh, and we typically have, 30 exposures a night, you know, so that's 900 uh, 4K by 4K images. I mean, that's basically all our data, and that, plus calibration frames. So maybe even if you double that, it's it's almost less than a single uh, ver <laughs> LSST survey exposure. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, Jacopo, go ahead. Oh, hi, I, I was just curious, you show a, a complete spectrum, so with the three branches, the um, so that comes, all the spectra will come like that. So they will be quite well calibrated within the three wavelength range. Because I have experienced that sometimes you get miscalibration and it's almost impossible to get the spectrum together. Yeah, so the stack I was showing you, for instance, was just all of that. Ad I mean, I didn't do any fudging to the data, right? So on each, uh, we typically have about, uh, I want to say there are 40 sky fibers per petal, uh, so 400 sky fibers uh, across the, uh, the entire survey, and there are about 10 standard stars on each petal. 
So about 100 standard stars. So, and those are mainly F stars, spectra, just like Sloan used. Uh, and they just go through the standard pipeline, cal they're calibrated. And then we check the calibration using white dwarf. So we're actually trying to do almost every white dwarf in the Gaia catalog that's within our footprint. Um, and and uh, it, it's actually amazing because uh, like every 10th white dwarf you look at looks like it has, uh, you know, the calcium H and K absorption lines, which are a sign of debris, right, from planetary uh, debris. So it, it, it's, it's the, 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 Spectrophotometric calibration is, I should say, the spectroscopic photometric calibration is very good. You don't see the gaps between the spectra, and, and each uh, individual arm actually overlaps through the dichroic. So you have some relative, you have a little better signal to noise just in that region, not better signal to noise, but the signal to noise of each individual arm is falling off at these regions, and you can regain it by co adding the spectra there. Uh, the data as we're storing it and releasing it currently are in these three separate arms but they're calibrated. So you just have to add them together however you want. I made those by just picking a wavelength at which I spliced them together and that was it. Okay, okay, that seems very great, thanks. Thanks, Jacob. We have time for one more question, if there is any. Okay, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thanks, Ajay. Uh, thank you and thanks for the opportunity to chat. Goodbye, Arjun. Bye. Bye, Great to Arjun. see you all. Bye. Bye, Arjun. We still have to have that virtual glass of wine together. Exactly. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.